Pastors in stereo. <laughs> Thank you. I feel compelled to say Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is risen indeed. Oh. I love doing that. <laughs> so much power. Yes. We should do this every Sunday. No. Uh, well, welcome to part two of uh, our mini series on what does it mean to be a pastor and how did I get myself into this? <laughs> so every story is different. Every story uh, has meaning and purpose. Uh, I encourage you to politely interrupt with a question rather than waiting all to the end. And we need to keep in mind that uh, these two gentlemen uh, have to get back to work <laughs> because we know that's the only thing they do, just preach each Sunday and that's it. <laughs> so, but I need to say, just on a very personal level, I am filled with joy when I'm with the two of them. They support me, they lift me up, they inspire me. The way in which they lead their lives is just good. And they are good people. Thank you. So, Amen. so what do we say? Yeah, what do we do? <laughs> Let, let me offer something to provide some context, okay? To put you two guys at ease. Feel relaxed and don't feel put on the spot. I have here a very good article, and you, you probably you, you probably have seen it. Maybe you've seen it too. The perfect pastor. <laughs> the results of a computerized survey indicate the perfect pastor preaches exactly 15 minutes. He condemns sin but never upsets anyone. <laughs> Notice, by the way, I didn't do the pronoun. But the pronoun was here, okay? You can yeah. say he, she if you want, but in your case, it happens to work. So. Uh, he works from 8 a.m. until midnight and is also a janitor. He makes, he makes $50 a week, wears good clothes, buys good books, drives a good car, and gives about $50 weekly to the poor. He is 28 years of age and has been preaching 30 years. <laughs> A great desire to work with teenagers and spends all his time with senior citizens. <laughs> the perfect pastor smiles all the time with a straight face because he has a sense of humor that keeps him seriously dedicated to his work. He makes 15 calls daily on, on parish families, shut ins, and hospitalized. He spends all his time evangelizing the unchurched and always in his office when needed. If your pastor does not, here's the important part. If your pastor does not measure up, simply send this letter to six other parishes that are tired of their pastors too. Then bundle up your pastor and send him to the church at the top of the list. In one week, you will receive 1,643 pastors and more of them Have faith in this letter. One church broke the chain and got its old pastor back. <laughs> oh, that's bad. Where you find that? I, I thought I'd start with some humor because uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I have friends that are pastors and former pastors, some of them, because I went to Concordia and St. Paul <laughs> in preparation to go to the seminary, but life happened and I didn't go. But I have a lot of friends who are pastors and I've heard a lot of stories. It's not an easy job. And I do know this, and I say this. It, 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 I'm, I'm being honest, and, and you know, when I listen to my friends, they, they're, they're, this was a Missouri Senate school, okay, and some of them are not Missouri Senate anymore. When I, and they're still my friends to this day, we get together every summer just for a reason. I could have never done their job. I could not do your jobs, not in a million years. Uh, it, so I thank you that you can do the impossible. You might not satisfy this letter, but you, you know you, it shows the expectations are often unrealistic, and you're human, and that's what I love about both of you. And uh, so I just wanted to let you know that at the get go. Thanks, Tony. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You can leave. <laughs> <laughs> now you know what to say. <laughs> um. I did give them, the old teacher and me, a list of questions, but I told them they could ignore them, which of course you can. Uh, and as a teacher, you've got to, 
used to that. <laughs> uh, but uh, how about if you, both of you at different times, um, just give us a little background of who you are in the sense that that might allow us to understand you being here. Chronological. Okay. Um, well, my background's a little bit different, I think. I mean, when I was nine years old, my older sister died, and that was the most formative event in my life. And um, in our family, we were surrounded by the people of the church, and, and there was some continuity between that and, and the family. My mother's family all belonged to one congregation. There were about 50 of us, I think, in this one congregation. And my father's family were Mennonite, and they belonged to various congregations, but everybody lived here by it. And so I grew up with a real sense of community about which I speak in today's sermon a bit. Um, and that community supported us through that experience. As, as an adult, I mean, we weren't, my brother and I were not excluded from any part of this. I mean, we didn't, no one said to us, your sister's going to die. But once she died, you know, we went with our parents to the funeral home. I remember walking around in there, picking out a casket and, you know, all the things that you do. We weren't excluded from anything. And if I ask my father a question like, you know, why did Ruthann have to die? His answer would be, I don't know. He didn't try to, you know, right, or make believe that he knew something he didn't know. So I, I, my whole ministry has been, I would say, probably lived out of that event, that this sense of community, you know, our faith in Jesus Christ is, is an embodied faith. You know, first, our faith is embodied in Jesus, you know, God taking on human form, but then Jesus is embodied in the church, and, and it's as we care for one another and support one another um, that we experience the presence of God. Now, this has implications for the way I do things and has had over the years, which is, for example, um, I'm less focused on individuals than I am on the welfare of the community as a whole. And, you know, sometimes there's a conflict between those two things. And I'm one who's always going to come out on the side of the welfare of the community. Um, because that's, that's how God's presence is, is embodied. And um, so... I would say that the greatest challenge for me as a pastor is I've been a pastor now for 48 years, um, but I've been working in the church, you know, for 50. Um, and for at least since the 1980s, I've watched as the culture has moved away from our understanding of the importance of community our culture has become more and more atomized, that it's about me and mine, and maybe us versus them, which I say in today's sermon. But, Esther, look to your left up on the wall. But especially, yeah, yeah. 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 But especially the focus is on, on individuals and not on the community. And the, the church's story is completely opposite of that. And, and I think we as congregations have to stand up against it even. That it, this, well, I also think it's a distortion of the national story, but that's a whole other thing. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to go there. It's just, but as a community of faith, we have a real responsibility to say we're all in this together. God is present among us. And it's not us versus them. It's how can we reach beyond the boundaries and be more inclusive. So I've said that. How many cousins do you keep in touch with? 
Well, he's just he's, <laughs> since he served in the community where most of my relatives live, <laughs> he kept running into them. Um, you know, it's hard for me to answer that question. I have 50 first cousins on my father's side and 17 on my mother's side. And, well, I know, keep track so of most of them that are low. I, I keep track. I try to keep track of them. Um, my uh, my sense of call was shaped at an early age too. I, I grew up in the Missouri Synod Church in, in Maryland and um, had some great pastors, uh, but didn't want to go ever and uh, hated acolyting. It's also ironic. I didn't like uh, acolyting. I couldn't wait to get done with confirmation. And um, when I was done confirmation, my mom, I think we'd, I'd exhausted my mother. So <laughs> Like, yeah, that's that's it. And uh, so that was kind of it. And uh, I wound up going to a Catholic high school to play basketball, also ironic, um, uh, for a couple of years. And, well, I was, you know, I was a center in middle school and then became a very small guard by high school. <laughs> uh, so I wasn't that very good. But um, I got recruited to this Catholic high school and a very good basketball program. And um, so there were prayers, you know, rosary, there was mass, and, you know, I, I found it pretty interesting, actually. I remember going out to, like, oh, we're praying the rosary after, you know, when school lets out at 2.30 or whatever, and I'd, I'd go and stand there and just sort of take it in. So I guess there was sort of a curiosity. But around that time, my folks divorced. Um, my dad moved to Florida, so I was splitting time during the year with school year with my mom, summers with my dad. And then uh, as a 16 year old, I thought, well, Florida seems like a much better choice. <laughs> uh, you know, we we're at the beach on the Gulf Coast. And um, so moved down there. I lived with my dad and my grandmother. And uh, it was not what I had expected or hoped that it would be. And um, so I think, uh, you know, my kind of world sort of uh, kind of blew up. And uh, the kind of story, my story got disrupted, we're saying today. And so uh, I took myself to church. I went one Sunday, went to a Lutheran church all by myself. I took myself. And then uh, soon after, I was invited to this little, Pente very small Pentecostal church. You know, this, the Gulf Coast is really kind of still the Bible Belt. And um, I started going to that church, and uh, people loved me. And I just remember crying all the time at those services. And uh, just felt like that was the place that could handle my sadness, my brokenness, my grief, my, you know, anger, all of it. And, um, and so I, you know, I was there three times a week, at least with the youth group and Sunday morning worship, Sunday evening worship, Wednesday worship. Um, and I think people recognized in me pretty early, um, sort of maybe a capacity or a calling and a sort of external <clears throat> kind of thing. And so they gave me sort of roles with youth group, you know, would you do the devotion, would you do the opening, would you be willing to do this and that, and um, so I did all those things, and um, that's really where my, I thought my, felt like my heart got healed, and, uh, but I knew I wasn't going to be a Pentecost, <laughs> I never spoke in tongues, I was never slain in the spirit, uh, but I saw all the things, and, uh, and, and honored it, but I didn't really care for the theology, which says, you know, you've got to be right with God and you've got to worry about backsliding. And, you know, it was the, the same thing Martin Luther worried about in his time in the 1500s. Am I right with God? Am I justified with God? And, um, it was always this back and forth and uh, very dependent on you uh, rather than, than God. So I said, well, I'm not a Pentecostal. And I sort of meandered through and um, I went to a Methodist college um, was in the chapel there, which was non-denominational. And then I went to Harvard Divinity because I felt this strong call in my life, but um, I didn't know what denominational home where I belonged. And um, my first year, I kind of met with a lot of the denominational advisors. And then a year later, we up with the Lutherans, with the ELCA Lutherans uh, there in, in University of Lutheran at Harvard Square. So um, I joined that church and became Lutheran again. <laughs> and uh, and started my ordination process like a year later. So. Your confirmation success story. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, right. Yeah. I stayed. <laughs> well, you didn't stay, but you came back. Oh, I came back. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So I guess. Um, Training. Yeah. So I guess for me, the church is, uh, you know, if, if I can 
or we can provide a place like that for people the way that those people created that space for me with the love and the affirmation and um, the kind of holding space um, you know that's what I would want to give provide and, and be you know for other people so did each of you feel that you either were given or found a place that was just right for you in all your meanderings and navigating through life and jumping through the hoops of life when you came to the decision okay this is where i want to be what were the visceral feelings i'm always interested um, in that well i had no choice i mean my i just felt with my call there you go i had no choice but to do this I and, and well i always felt like i could go and do something else i flirted with phd programs you know and stuff and i just felt it always come back to this and so why not do it now <laughs> while we're young <laughs> you know so um, I, it's like this is my path yeah yeah i would say so, something similar i mean when i was in college i became very aware in my freshman year um how lost most of my classmates were and i didn't have that feeling i didn't feel lost i mean you know, there's that kind of identity crisis that goes with a lot of being, you know, away from home. I was eight hours drive away from home. I wanted to be away from home, just, you know, get started being on my own and what that would mean. But, I mean, I went to college in the late 60s. Uh, and, you know, drugs were everywhere. And um, I just didn't feel any impetus even for that. Well, so if I smoked marijuana, I would just fall asleep. And so maybe I tried it twice. And every time you were listening to Jethro Tull, so anytime I hear Jethro Tull, I, hear, I smell marijuana. <laughs> You know, it was just, I mean, it was a crazy time. I was in college from 66 to 70, so, you know, we had all sorts of things going on. And, I, you know, I, I, a lot of my classmates were just like at loose ends and they were getting high all the time. And I'm like, no, no, you know, I, I had this sense that I had a background that could provide some stability for for people in a, you know, and leading a congregation. And I, since I'd grown up in a congregation, you know, where our family was the biggest group and one of my uncles was the person who would stand up at every congregational meeting and try to make trouble about something. <laughs> and another one was one of the people who always voted no. <laughs> you know, I mean, it just, yeah, so. I would agree. It was kind of like, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. Did you ever come across people who you thought should not be where you are? Yes. Yes. We talked a lot about that. <laughs> over lunches. Not that we're judgmental. Um, I met a few by way of my husband, not that he was one, but I would meet these people and I'd say to him, how did they ever become a pastor? They are seriously toxic or were seriously wrong or seriously messed up. So that leads me to the preparation at seminary. Does it, how well does it prepare you for life as a pastor? Um, were you given some coursework and things that you had to learn on your own when you became a pastor? Yeah, yeah sure. I'll go first. <laughs> the most important thing I think that seminary does is to prepare you to preach. And that the pieces of that are large, not only the mechanics of preaching, but especially what are you looking at when you're looking at biblical texts? How do you approach them? And to have a theological perspective. 
I was fortunate that when I was growing up, our pastor, and this is my confirmation pastor, was theologically pretty astute. So when I got to seminary, I didn't really have trouble with that part. You know, like the Lutheran doctrine courses and stuff, I always got A's because I, I knew the answers. <laughs> <laughs> I had imbibed them in confirmation. Um, but, you know, sometimes people think that seminary prepares you for being, for the practical parts of being a pastor. And generally, that's not true. That's the way you true. learn that is field work, field ed, and internship. And I was blessed to have a really capable internship supervisor who had, I don't know, 30 some interns over the years. I think I was number 12. So he really knew what he was doing. And for him, he always said, well, this is my continuing education, is having these students come in, because they always have ideas. And, um, you know, so watching him, I learned a lot. Um, and, um, and then, you know, I learned a lot over the years, you know, there's just, there's no substitute for making mistakes, too. And then I go, oh, that didn't work. I won't do that again. Right. <laughs> or that did work. Oh, you know, we should try that here. Um, and I had other mentors. Um, one of them was somebody, some of you might know, John Cochran, who had been a pastor in Philadelphia from like 68 to, when did he leave? sometime in the 80s and went to Pittsburgh. And being, pardon? Yeah, being around him, I learned all sorts of things. Um, just um, some of it was the importance of sociology. Um, in, in fact, I have a saying, the churches fail not because of bad theology. You have bad theology and people will go anyway. But if you have bad sociology, you will fail. You've got to pay attention to your community and to the people that you've got there and, and really make sure that your ministry is rooted in the community that you are serving. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's enough. For me. There's a, yes, we, there's a refrain that's very frequent. Well, we didn't learn this in seminary, didn't we? Yeah. Seminary. <laughs> but, um, and and um, yeah, I think the biblical and theological grounding is really the the thing. Um, and the and the mentors, the the people that you you know, while you're trying to figure out who you are as a pastor, and you model yourself on these people who you admire. And um, and I was lucky uh, in Duke School and Seminary to have people that. I really admire who were just excellent people, scholars, pastors, and to see them, you know, in the classroom, in the pulpit, um, to have conversations with them really meant a, a lot to me. I mean, I've been very fortunate from growing up from my childhood pastor all the way uh, till now to have great, great mentors, people who've really invested in me over the course of my studies and my, my career. Um, so I think it, for me, it's, you know, you're just not going to get, you, you can take church administration, you can take pastoral care, you can, you can take those courses, but until you're it, doing, um, it, yeah. doing it, you know, and it's, uh, I, I learned a lot on my last, my first church, your, your, your first call church, <laughs> you do. Is, a, is you, you yeah. learn a lot, and they, they, about yourself they, or others. Both, both, and they, and they teach you, I mean, often, um, you know, I, they were very gracious. Um, like there are things I look back and say, well, we wouldn't have done that. <laughs> or we wouldn't have done it the same way, or I know better now, or whatever. And um, they were they were great. So were I mean, you an associate pastor at that first? No, a solo pastor. That's really different. Yeah. yeah. Well, now that depends. Yeah. Like I knew coming out of seminary that I couldn't be the associate for <laughs> 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 Now, <laughs> I, couldn't do it, I can do it now, but I couldn't do it when I was young. But if you're just learning how to be a pastor, that would be, when I, I, mean, when I interviewed you. Wow, that's uh, interesting that they have different. The chair of my call committee was a uh, was an airline pilot. 
And uh, he said, you know, when you're in the cockpit and the, the navigator looks over to the first mate, and the first mate then looks to the left and looks over to the captain, and the captain looks left and sees his reflection in the What churches did you both um, start out in and then? Were you were you pastors in up to this church? Mm. And how long have you been here? Mm. Well, I have a little shorter story. Um, <laughs> so I served one church before I got here, and it was the Lutheran Church of the Redeemer in Woburn, Massachusetts, which is in the Boston metro area. Um, so I served uh, Redeemer for eight and, a, eight and a half years as a solo pastor there, and it was a congregation about 125 on Sunday. Um, and uh, so, uh, and then uh, came here. That's why I started in, um, I started days before Christmas Eve. I started December 21st, 2003. I really wanted to meet everybody who was going to be there for Christmas. And that, day, that was insane. I was probably, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then I had a funeral. Then I had a death like the, that more uh, Christmas, Christmas Eve morning. Anyway, um, so 2003 to 2012. And then I came here August 2012. And I need to say, to be very forthright, we pursued him. We went after him. Uh, and uh, which normally is not the case, but his reputation preceded him. Uh, and then I met his wife. And you really thought it. I met his wife and I hugged her in typical Dottie fashion. I whispered in her ear. Just trust us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. People meet Jenny, they're like, oh, you're okay. <laughs> my, my internship, but my, my internship supervisor that I had, who was wonderful, uh, met him at like the training thing and then uh, took Jenny and I out to dinner. And then once he met Jenny, he was like, oh, you'll be fine. <laughs> you made a very good life choice. Offered me a job on stuff. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Which I need to say as a former pastor's wife. Um, you are judged you know, for a position that you're not going for, yeah. you know, and have a few credentials on your own, but they don't matter. They don't matter squat. And I would hope that has changed. <clears throat> I don't well, Jenny's breaking the mold. Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to remind you people that it is Easter. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not following you. If you think of undressed something else. I'm dressed for Easter. Oh, oh dear. Okay. Okay. Uh, I know you love books mm -hmm. and you reference books often. It, so could you speak to that? Um, the importance of reading. Uh, the importance of reading. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I love, love to read. Um, yeah. I'm doing audiobooks more now on walks with the dog and, and stuff. So, but, um, when you're preaching a lot and you're doing a lot of things, you've got to, you know, you've got to feed your mind, your soul, and, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm next, I'm preaching next week and I'm talking about a book that I just mm -hmm. listened to that I haven't preached about yet, but, um, yeah, it's just like a, a well that you have to keep and kind of stopped and, and, and deep. So. And, and how does your writing fit in with your schedule? <laughs> right. <laughs> what writing? <laughs> uh, he doesn't have time for that. Yeah, not sure. anymore. Not anymore. Um, when I was writing high volumes and writing the books, um, it was not advisable to have done that. I mean, it was like, I really, I really, uh, you know, it's something I wanted to do and felt like there was something important to say. <clears throat> but uh, you did write a couple books. Yeah. But it crushed me um, because uh, I mean you know it's early mornings it's late nights it's work and kids and so forth and um, I think there were important stories to be told and but um, you know that was the that was the time for it and um, you know there may be another time to write later but but not now you know and in some ways I'm the things I was writing about were anticipating all the things we've seen during COVID right the the digital stuff, but also the ways the church is evolving. So it's really sort of, um, it's so I felt fortunate, like I did all that research like 10 years ago, mm -hmm. um, or, you know, between five and 10 years ago for people that were on the edge of it. So mm -hmm. it's really living out those ideas 
in real life, you know. So I'm still I'm still in that digital cathedral, you know. It's just um, we're we're living it now, so which is kind of cool. We're in it with you. You brought us into it. Yeah, it's good. Yes. Getting back to George Virginia's tell, oh, yeah. the other tell George, the George, other George, half of Virginia's question to you. Oh, where you started. <clears throat> I, I started out in Queens, in New York City, and um, while I was there, I was there 10 years. Paul Beck was my next neighbor for four years while I was, that's when we met. In Queens, uh, New York? In Queens, yes. Oh, cool. Yep. Uh, I was in Glendale and he was in Ridgewood. His church is still there, mine isn't. <laughs> <laughs> what does that say? <laughs> No, I'm not sure. <laughs> then I went to Bridgeport, Connecticut, and uh, he came to Norristown. But while I was in Bridgeport, then he left Norristown and went to Worcester, Massachusetts. So I, I visited you the day that you moved to Pennsylvania, I think, because the Senate office was in the same town that they were living, and I had a meeting. Same building. <laughs> yeah, I worked in. That's right. Yeah. So anyway, we. So I was in Newport, Connecticut for six and a half. And then my mother had Alzheimer's disease and was in the Lutheran community at Telford. And I wanted to get, I never wanted to serve in this synod as a young person. Why? Why? Because the synod was stuck in its ways and was not in any way, shape, or form progressive. Now, I just thought it was horrible. You know, the only churches, as far as I was concerned, that were worth being around were the ones that were in the city. And I went, when I was home on vacation, I would go to Emmanuel in South Philadelphia. But, <clears throat> you know, when you're a young person, someone like me, have very strong opinions. And, uh, <laughs> no. Only when you're young. Yeah, yeah right, right. Now you're young. <laughs> but a shadow of my opinions. <laughs> when he was here before yeah that was only 10 years oh ago. yeah 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 so you don't remind us of yeah. anyway, <laughs> anyway so then i came to grace in norristown um and the reason really was to be nearby so that i could visit my mother every week um and that that's a congregation that was not rooted in its community norristown had changed and they didn't change with it um, I mean, the most basic thing was that they didn't have a nursery school or a daycare center or anything like that. And the churches on the west end of Norristown that have survived all have those things. And this one didn't have it, and they weren't about to do it. They closed, too, um, <laughs> three years ago. Getting um, a complex fund? <laughs> well, so did, so did the one in, so three. Like, the whole three was, by the time I've been there, oh, I don't know, maybe nine, eight or nine years, I realized that this was not going anywhere, and I wanted to do something else, and the opportunities that were presented weren't very attractive. And I had a friend who was an interim pastor in Wisconsin. And he kept bugging me about it, telling me I'd be good at that. And then I got a phone call from somebody in Baltimore. Would I be interested in being the interim senior pastor of a big congregation that had just fired their pastor? <laughs> sure. <laughs> so that's how I got into interim ministry. And I was at that church for two years. And then I was at Christ in York for two years as the interim pastor after a close friend of mine who had been the senior pastor there became Roman Catholic. Uh, and then, then I had a settled call in Wisconsin, in Appleton um, for three and a half years in a big congregation. And I'll say, honestly, I didn't know what I was doing. It's something I'd always wanted to try. I mean, this is a congregation that has two sites. So we had five services on Sunday, wow. three at one, site and two at the other. And it was really mostly a management job. And what I learned there is I don't smile enough. <laughs> because when you're in a big church like that, it's like you're more like a TV personality than, yeah. than you know, like you are here, the pastor of a community. And that's not my thing. So anyway, 
when uh, when we left there, we came back to to this area, uh, to Norristown, essentially, and I became an interim pastor in this synod. So I was an interim at Trinity Berkesey, where one of the other two full-time staff people was also named Detweiler and was my second cousin. <laughs> She's still there. The church is still open. Yes. Yeah, so they, they, they're going to make it. They're fine. I'm going to rename it the Church of Detweiler. You know, not quite. And then, then I came here for four months. And then I went to Camp Hill for, um, for a year. And from Camp Hill, I went to University of Lutheran in Philadelphia for two years. And then I was a year and a half in <coughs> New York City at Holy Trinity on Central Park West. <clears throat> and and after that, I was in Freehold, New Jersey. Then I took a year off um, and then got back into it in the Northeast Penn Synod. Uh, one of the unusual things about me is that I've served in eight different synods. Is that look good on your resume? Uh, well, you know what? Yesterday I was reading the obituaries in the Living Lutheran. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, list, they list all the calls that people have that I'm taking all of my life. <laughs> when I die, it's going to be a So here I am. Listen, be before we have to close because of time, yes. uh, Pastor Keith, yeah. uh, you okay. came to us with one church under the belt come into a church that is welcoming, but I will say not always easy because we have, you know, a lot of different opinions. Um, strong opinions. Strongly strong expressed. Strong, strong opinions. Yeah. Strong. Yes. Yes, we do. I can speak to that. Can I not? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, having said all this, greatest joy Greatest challenge. Greatest challenge. Oh, no. <laughs> I know. We only have time for the first one. <laughs> <laughs> Saved by a fellow pastor. Yes. <laughs> I can do the second one. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. I don't mean name people. No. Uh -uh. no. Oh, we just talk well, let me take a chat. chat. Crack at it, and then you can. Um, I think the um, there are sort of two sides of the same coin. So um, the joy and the challenge is that um, we're in a, a congregation and in a time in our culture, it's like a lot of transition yeah. happening, right? So there's a lot of generational transition happening in the church. Um, we've lost a lot of our saints. Um, you know, COVID's really accelerated every possible change that we could experience right um because like i you know i was um i i, I had the range for about four months until COVID hit right like so yeah. it's like so and and i'm a gen xer and the and it's a little small generational cohort and my job is to um kind of hand things on you know um to receive them from the generations that have come before me and make a space for the generations to come and hand down the wisdom, the love, the, you know, the practices, the stories. Um, and so that's delightful and it's joyful. Um, and it's really hard. Yes, it you is. know, it's, it's really hard to, um, you know, to, uh, it's very hard. Um, so, uh, yeah, go ahead. That's a good answer. <laughs> no, I would just, build on that I because that I mean it on my resume it says my personal mission is to basically to do that to hand on what we've received to the generations of my children and grandchildren <clears throat> and I'm afraid that my generation's not been real good at this <laughs> and I you know we really have to to work at it and this is the one advantage of being older I'm not speaking to or people about people who are different from me. I'm speaking to my generation, essentially, and people who may be a little bit older, that we really have to understand that things are not the way they were and that 
the world has changed a lot and how the gospel is going to be embodied is, is different. But I also want to say something complimentary about this congregation. I don't want you to sell yourself short because I think this congregation has a more highly developed sense of community than most and that that is the great gift that you have to give um, to the larger community. And, and it's hard work to keep people engaged. And yes, we have strong opinions, but he does a very good job of, as I tease him about, of making nice. But it's more than just making nice. It's, it's really helping people feel like they belong. And that's really important here. Um, well, it's important everywhere, but I think it's, in some ways, it's maybe easier here. Um, it's really important that we're able to have people of differing opinions and understandings and that we can talk to each other and um, work together. Music, music for all. Well, and music really helps because it helps bring us together. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I need to say that we, as Lutherans, we use the word grace quite a bit. Uh, I worked with a few pastors here and it's been a very good experience for me, a growing experience for me, but the grace that exists right now, the dedication that exists right now is more than I have ever experienced. Uh, challenges bring out the best in us or the worst in us. You're looking at two people, people, not saints, people who work so hard, who give so much, with such graciousness. <laughs> Say, I feel, so I'm being honest. I'm being honest. And I, I am just so honored to be a part of this congregation. This church saved me. Ask my family. It saved me. So I can never give back enough of what it did for me. Yeah. So we thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure and an honor and a gift and a grace to pastor this church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.